Audrey and I chatted with an old friend, Dr. Heather Nero, who was a colleague going all the way back in the 1990s when we were in Saudi Arabia together. Currently, Heather works as an administrator at the International Community School of Abidjan. You can read her full biography in our show notes. What was really cool is we caught up with Heather kind of in between recruiting fairs. She'd just been in London, and we caught up with her in Boston. So this is a really just-in-time catching up on what's happening in the recruiting world So we learned a lot, and we think you will as well. We covered multiple topics. Here are a few. So one was getting the angle of recruiting from the recruiter. We looked at changes in recruiting over the past few years. And we also, once again, heard of the value of face-to-face meetings at recruitment fairs. We picked up a few interview tips and insights on how to recruit once you complete your teaching degree, whether you should go for it right off the bat or maybe try to get a couple years of teaching experience before you go overseas. And we learned a lot more. So it was really fun listening to Heather and gathering knowledge from her. So we really appreciated her taking the time as she was preparing for an interview right after ours. So get ready for a really interesting kind of finger on the pulse of what's happening in recruiting show. This episode was recorded on January 26, 2023. Welcome, Heather. We're so excited to have you on the show. We've been looking forward to this really for months. But we also know you're on the road. So where in the world are you and what are you up to? Thanks, David. So I am currently in Boston, Massachusetts, gearing up for the Search Cambridge Fair, which starts tomorrow. Mm. But professionally, I am currently the lower school principal at the International Community School of Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire, West Africa. Awesome. I wish I was still living in Senegal. You know, we could have some good times, the Knobloch and us and you guys get together, (laughs) you know, when you're in the same corner of the world, the West Coast Africa contingent. So one thing we like to start with is a short going global story. Have you got one to share with us today, Heather? So let me start, since we're talking about recruiting today, with a recruitment story. So about 31 years ago, I guess. Now, 1992 was my first recruitment fair as a teacher. And I drove in a snowstorm from Toronto, Ontario, to Kingston, Ontario, at Queen's University. And I went with a girlfriend of mine, and we were both very excited to go overseas. And of course, back then, it was just, I want to go overseas. And overseas, to me, meant Europe. Uh I mean, I didn't know there was anywhere else other than Europe. So I was going to get a job in Europe and it was going to be great and all of that. So we show up at the job fair from this while driving in the snowstorm. And there are maybe 10 schools that showed up because there was a snowstorm. So everyone was snowed out. Yes. So I was like, okay, this is not going as planned. And I really wanted to go overseas. So I was talking to the head of the recruitment fair, Alan Travers, and at the end, I just kind of went up to him and I said, look, my name is Heather and I really want to, you know, get some more. How do I get to get to know people? There was no internet back then. It was, you know, all paper. You'd have to mail things. And Alan took my resume. And I remember this to this day. He took my resume and he put it on the top of his pile. Ooh. And I was a PE teacher back then. I put it on top of the pile and he said, you know, I'll let you know if anything comes up. Sorry, there were not very many schools here. And we got back in the car and drove back to Toronto. In March, I remember getting a phone call on the phone, landline and everything, <laughs> from a person in Egypt, Walid Abu Shakra, for those of you that know oh, no. Walid. And he basically talked to me for about 10 minutes and said, I want you to come to my school in Cairo. And I'm going, Cairo, Egypt, wow. And then all of a sudden, I had 48 hours to make a decision. And there I was, overseas in Cairo in August. That's just incredible, you know, the differences between sort of then and now where, you know, it's not like you could get online and just see what was out there or you could, 
you know, get someone's email and just write to them. It was what you see is what you get kind of thing. And Waleed was a real go-getter, had a lot of schools back in the day, you know. I don't know what he's up to now, but he really was a was a networker, shall we say. So that then Alan Travers, what a lovely man. I just have to give a little shout out to Alan because I went to Queens and he, you know, he organized that first fair in Canada and was just a wonderful, wonderful man. So good for him. Yep. I keep hearing about this Queens fair. So we've got to get <laughs> some, somebody's got to write a book, a history book. And someone should write a history book about Waleed in the early years. That's of true. international education, especially in the Middle East. So something to think about. Let's get Greg. Let's get Greg <laughs> <Lemoyne>. <laughs> Yeah, we'll get Greg on that one. All right, so we've got a big guiding question, and we're going to unpack it a bit. So I'm going to ask it, and if you could just give that first impression, and then we'll, we'll break it down a little bit. So here's our guiding question. What is the state of recruiting this year from a recruiter viewpoint? It's exciting. That's probably the best way to describe it right now. My first in-person fair was last weekend in London, and it was great to be in the same room as candidates because that hasn't happened since pre-COVID. So it's been three years, and it was really exciting to be with people in the same room, being able to see, talk to them, being able to maybe meet them after the fair, have a drink, all of those things that you can't do in a Zoom or a Skype interview. So it was really exciting, stressful. We've got a lot of jobs this year, and uh, it was really stressful to try and get the right candidates for our school. Okay. Well, yeah, I can imagine, you know, having known you from before you went admin track, I've been really excited and curious to ask you what it's like being the person on the other side of the table. And it sounds like it is pretty close to as rushed, stressful, intense as it is for teachers. Is that right? It's very true. So I look at it sort of like a jigsaw. I'm putting all the pieces in it. Yeah. And you've got to hire for the whole school. So you might need somebody in the elementary school and they've got a spouse who teaches in secondary school and it all has to match. Yeah. And I find it very stressful at the fair because it moves much quicker. I was doing reference checks at the fair. I was getting as many things as I can. When the people that I hired before the fair on Zoom, I did make them go to a couple different rounds. So we sort of had the initial interview with myself and the curriculum coordinator. Then they go to another round and then they go to a third round and we end up with a fourth round. Wow. So they're taught, yes. So we go through a much longer process, but at a fair, you just don't have the time to do that. It's much quicker. Right. So is it similar to back in the day where you have maybe a couple rounds and that's it? I think right now we've met only twice with any people that we offered mm -hmm. in the fair. We've only met them with them twice. Yeah. And our schedule was full. Yeah. Plenty of people want to come to West Africa. So that's not an issue. We offer a decent package, some nice housing, great benefits, very diverse school. So we were very attractive. So curious whether you feel like there's pressure on you to represent your school well, warts and all, or do you feel like you have the power to recruit the best possible teachers for the jobs? I'm sure that you are upfront knowing you, you're a straight shooter, that you are upfront about the challenges, but how do you go about that? part of it? That's a great question. And I think a lot of that comes out because we're very transparent when we go recruiting. And a lot of that comes out during the presentation. So every school has about a half an hour to do a presentation and then people can come to the presentation. And we're very blunt. We're in a country where there's malaria. And that's something that you need to deal with every day. So I leave the house every morning. I put bug spray on. You know, I've been fortunate that I've not had malaria and there's not a lot of people that I've known that have had malaria, but it is a disease that we have in West Africa. Our housing has been improving over the years, but say four or five years ago, we had some real housing issues at our school, and that was before my time, but now the housing is quite nice. We put all the teachers this past year that came in into a really nice apartment building and has a swimming pool. They love it because it's just, it's a perfect, nice, modern place for them to live. So I think for us, yeah, we just spell it out. We make it very clear. We have some challenges in some departments, and I'm very honest. I say, look, I need some changes in this department, and I need you as an incoming staff member to help us make those changes. Mm -hmm. That sounds reasonable. All right. So looking at the recruiting fairs, and we just keep hearing from veteran administrators and recruiting coaches, it's so important to go to these fairs, especially as newcomers. 
So what are some changes that you've seen over time in general, and then specifically just the last few years? We know COVID came in and really changed things a lot. So I guess broadly over the last several years, and then specifically the last couple years, and and how has your school maybe changed your hiring process? So broadly over the last, uh, say, 10 years, in the last 10-year span, we really went to more of a virtual situation. So the Zooming, and not the virtual fairs, and I can talk about the virtual fairs as well in a minute because uh, I'm not a big fan of them, but the virtual Zooming where you can have numerous interviews and they can meet different groups. For our high school teachers that we hire, they actually do an interview with the students. So we have a student group that have questions, and so they're put through this little you know, interview process. So when I say there's lots of different processes over the Zoom, we have many different processes in place. They meet the teachers, you know, the teachers they might be working with, they might meet the team leader, the department head, whatever it is. But in the high school, students actually speak to them as well. So I think that's been a big change in what we've been doing. But the, the face-to-face fairs, everybody that I spoke to last week in the London Fair agreed that the London Fair was a huge success. There were such great candidates so many interviews going on. We got turned down for a few, but we got a few. So it was kind of a win-win. And I think Jez said that, Jez Hayden, who was running the Search London Fair, that there's about 70% offers out there and maybe 40 to 50% actually accept them. Whereas in the virtual fairs, we did the virtual Africa Fair last year. We didn't offer one contract and it was very, very difficult. And that's for people who wanted to come to Africa. So that's a whole nother... I didn't like it very much. Wow. Do you want to talk about that now? Sure. So the Search Africa Fair was very fast. I had interviews every half an hour virtually, and I didn't really feel like I got to know people. Mm. Whereas when you're face to face, you meet them at the sign up. You meet them, you know, at the table. The interview, in some cases, went on longer than it was supposed to. For me, that was instrumental, I guess, in getting to know the people. Because you've got to make sure it's a fit for them and it's a fit for us. Mm -hmm. Very important. How do you do that in half an hour on a Zoom? Yeah, gotcha. No, you can't. It's true. It was just too hard. So along those lines, this being the first year to be back in person, you kind of touched on this earlier, but what kind of vibe are you picking up on from candidates and fellow recruiters this year compared to, like you say, the virtual that has been the last couple of years? The excitement, I think, just being in the same room, you know, they were, I have a lot of high energy, I know, but just being able to sit there and talk to them and hear what they want, you know, what they want out of a school and are we the right school to match that. The candidates were lovely, just super excited to get offered jobs. And I think most people walked away with, if not one offer, more than one, because I know we lost people to other schools. So they had multiple offers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is something that Greg Lemoyne, who wrote Finding the Right Fit, talked about how really important it is, that whole networking piece where you're in, you know, if you can stay in the hotel where the fair is mm-hmm. happening and in the evening, go down to the restaurant bar, whatever, and just meet people. You've got your name tag on and where you're from and you can share and you can receive information. Do you as a recruiter make a point of attending that kind of social hour just to a network, of course, with old friends, but also to meet candidates in a little more casual setting? Mm -hmm. I actually enjoy that and probably spend too much time doing that. (laughs) It's just that's just, uh, you know, who I am. But it does get to see the candidates as well in a different light. So spending time in the lobby or the hotel bar or wherever In London, there was a pub across the street. So whatever that looks like, yes, that to me, I think is really important because you're bringing the whole family over or whether it's a couple, a single, they've got kids, got to know a little bit more about them than just their, you know, can they teach that subject? And I think that's the difference between being overseas and being maybe back home. Back home, they just want to know, are you a good teacher? And are you going to thrive in that classroom? Whereas overseas, it's a whole package because I have teachers sometimes you know, they come in, it's their first year. By October, we've got our October slide. And, you know, I'm in their classrooms, checking on them, making sure that they're okay. Because that's a very difficult time for some people, Mm. especially if it's their first time overseas. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very difficult for anybody in their first year of a new country. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Big time. 
So one of the things, getting back to the trends a little bit more, and I had this experience that I'm sure Audrey and Mark did, that first it was Skype, then it was some type of video conferencing. So that makes a lot of sense. And you're really opening my eyes that you're connecting the kids to the process and other people in the school. As much as you can do that pre-work ahead of time to connect to people, so what are some other trends maybe you've picked up in, from other schools, the way they're recruiting, and who are people trying to go and recruit? What are you seeing in that area? And then I've got a couple of follow-up questions. So the trends are, and I'll use an example because I know you were at SSIS, David, Yes. is that we have a teacher that's leaving our school this year and going to SSIS. And they, just like we are, we have about four interviews when you're doing the Zoom, meeting the students and all of that. They did seven. So, so I know. Wow. I know. So she was a little nervous, but she got the job at the end of the day. But there's a lot going on. One of the things that I found was really interesting that happened recently. So I do soft searches. So we all put references on our resume and I do reference checks. I'm very meticulous about doing reference checks. And I do a, a phone call because you can sometimes pick up things from people's voices if you do a phone call yes. as opposed to an email. So I'm very meticulous about that. Right. But I do soft checks. So like if I know uh, there's a, somebody I just hired that's coming out of Korea and I know they work together with somebody in China. And so what I did is I reached out to that person that worked with them. So they're not a reference, but it's a soft one. And it was funny because I was soft reference checked for a counselor <laughs> that I just hired with somebody that you guys know. So I did my reference check, John Gaylord. She worked with John oh, Gaylord yes. in, in Korea. And you guys know John. Yeah. And so I was getting in touch with John and I said, you know, tell me about this teacher. And she reached out to John and said, tell me about Heather. What's Heather like to work for? And I, thought, I love oh. it. I love it. It was great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good for her. So I'm not sure if I answered that question fully, but yeah. that's, that's kind yeah. of some of the, the trends that are happening now. Well, the networking between the administrators, that has been there for a while, but now more than ever. And the idea of doing that soft check-in, that makes a lot of sense. And specifically for your school, looking at your other administrators, have they mentioned any changes that the school has made in the past? You were saying earlier that your school starts a little bit later mm -hmm. in the recruiting season. Is there anything else that's changed? And maybe anything like COVID, has that had repercussions, whether negative or positive, in your recruiting? So, no, COVID, to be honest, has not had a lot of impact. I mean, before COVID, we were still doing virtual Zooms and all of that. It's just nice to be back face to face right now. Our school, we were very lucky because during COVID, we were only shut down from sort of that March time to June. Then we were back face to face. Not a lot of schools were able wow. to do that. Yeah. So we were in a very lucky spot. So there was not that huge gap in learning that other schools were experiencing. With the other administrators at my school, we are a very cohesive senior leadership team, so we all work very closely together with everything that we do. We make concessions. This maybe is not the best, <laughs> best thing to say, but you know, there might be one teacher that I'm really, really, really interested in. They've got a spouse that can do something in the upper school, and we say, now they're not maybe the top candidate, but them together as a couple. So we make sort of those concessions as, as we go along. We say, okay, as a couple, this couple might work really well at our school. I know that single other person over there might have been better, but we want it to fit as a whole package. So we do do a lot of that as well. So you're finding the right fit as well. Yes. <laughs> yes. So it really sounds like things are kind of getting back to how they were, and that's fantastic to hear. Wondering if what kind of advice would you have, just to kind of switch gears a little here, one thing that we are trying to do is to connect with people who are kind of brand new to international teaching and, you know, help them with what it's all about, what's the process of recruiting like, what to look out for in schools. And, you know, one part of that group is going to, of course, be people fresh out of teaching college or just having gotten certified, maybe haven't even got a lot of teaching experience, if at all. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for students in university who are just completing their studies to become a teacher? Are there factors they should consider before recruiting internationally? This is a great question. And I spend a lot of time as my own two children are not 
far out of university themselves and some of their friends are interested in going into international education. So I spent a lot of time talking to people like that. And I think my biggest advice to anybody going overseas is do your research first. So like I had said earlier, you know, make sure you're signed up for a reputable company, but do your research on the school. When you are applying to a school, you know, I had an application recently and it was emailed to me. So it was sent straight to my email, which you can find my email on the website. Most international schools have the leadership team's emails mm -hmm. there and easy to find. And it said, dear sirs, oh, I can tell you how far I read. I read the dear sirs and I said, okay, bye-bye. Oh no. Oh no. Mm -hmm. So that first impression that people are making is so important. Know what to call them. You know, I don't appreciate it as well when somebody calls me Mrs. Narrow. And I know that sounds kind of, you know, I'm, I'm not just my husband's wife. So research and figure out who I am. I think that's really important. Right. Make sure you link something in, in that cover letter to the school's mission, vision, whatever that is, but tie it in to who you are so that we know as uh, recruiters that you have actually done your research and you know what you're talking about. I'm at a school right now, which is a CGC school, Common Ground Collaborative. It's much newer than say the PYP or you know, the I, any of the IB programs, but do a little bit of research and know, know at least what CGC stands for so that you can talk a little bit of it. We will hire you with no CGC experience and we'll give you the training that's necessary, but don't pretend you don't know what it is. So really going back to that research piece and knowing who you're writing to, apply in two different ways. For instance, if you're doing search, you can apply directly on the search portals and you can write to the people, but also then go onto the website and find out who the principal is that's doing the hiring and apply to them directly in another email, because then it shows you really care and you're really interested in that particular school. Well, and just to go back to what you said about Dear Sirs and CGC, it's also, I think, about demonstrating as a candidate that you didn't just send one blanket email cover letter to a whole bunch of schools without, like you say, actually researching each school and you know knowing what some of those differences are. So I think that that's a really good point that any candidate, whether a brand new teacher or experienced, should be, like you say, doing that research for themselves too, you know, is this a good fit? You know, I know like my husband, Mark, isn't super keen on the middle years program math curriculum. And so he makes sure to check that, you know, that a school is using either, you know, Common Core or some other math curriculum in the middle school. And he only wants to teach middle school math. So he just really focuses in that way. But yeah, no, you're totally right. They should be doing their research, but also demonstrating that they've done their research to kind of prove that they do care about that particular school. Just a little side question you know, we recently had an interview with a soon to be certified teacher, brand new. It sounds like you finished your certification and went immediately overseas. There's sort of two sides to this coin. What do you think about that person staying in their home country and getting their feet wet? That's what I did. I did a couple of years of teaching to get the experience because otherwise you're going overseas and learning to be a teacher while also facing new country, halfway around the world, away from your family and everybody, your network, and also maybe potentially not speaking the language and all the other challenges that come along with that. So there's two sides of the coin. How do you approach that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I was similar to you. I did two years in Toronto. Okay. So I did my, I did my two years. I got my, you know, my feet wet, if you will, and then went overseas okay. that third year of teaching. I think that is probably the best thing to do because at least you're not a brand new teacher. Okay. I personally don't hire teachers with no experience at all. Okay. Some schools do. And there's a new program with search in particular that does internships. Ah. And that gets people with their feet wet. We work with a, a university in the Netherlands and do a great student teaching program. And so we have a student teacher coming out in February and she'll be there for about 10 weeks. And if your student teaching program allows you to have that student teaching overseas, I also recommend that because it gives you that, you know, length of time, you get to see what it's like. And I think those are really good opportunities. For us, we like to hire people with at least two years experience. You have to be certified. Of course, that's a requirement. 
Some schools, maybe that's not a requirement, but for us, we want to make sure we have the highest quality we can possibly have. So, but what about someone who really is ready and maybe has done an internship abroad or something like that and has done some substitute, you know, has gotten their feet, let's say, wet and they feel ready. Mm -hmm. Are there enough schools out there? You referenced that there are some schools out there that hire brand new teachers. Do you think there are enough out there to make it worth them going through a whole search process if they feel ready? If they feel ready, yes. I think there's enough out there, but it's maybe you're not looking at the top quality schools mm -hmm. that you, you know, you're not looking at the embassy schools. Mm -hmm. You're looking at the for-profit schools and, the, you know, that's where I started out. I started out a for-profit school. Yeah. You know, it's the ESL schools and maybe you put in your time, you know, your two years, if you will, and then go somewhere else. Right. But you got to get your feet wet somewhere and the salary might not be the same because the savings potential is huge in a lot of countries. So you go, you break even, and then you look for something else once you've got your feet wet. Mm -hmm. Do you think that recruiters would see experience of two years teaching overseas at a, let's say, lower tier school mm -hmm. as being, you know, as valuable as two yeah. years of experience in, you know, the States, Canada, Australia, England, whatever? Yes, because the one thing, the advantage for that is that if they've already done two years at maybe sort of a lower tier school is that, you know, they can do it. Yeah, right. Um, so you're not dealing with that aspect of it. And even in some of those lower quality schools, there's some excellent teachers there. Right. So you could be mentored by somebody that's an amazing mentor teacher. Right. And I think you can learn a lot from that. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Because we've talked about this amongst ourselves and we feel like there are kind of two sides to it. And I guess what we landed on is it depends on the person. It <laughs> depends on their readiness. It depends on, you know, how they feel about that whole thing. Because the other piece is what happened to friends of mine is they stayed and did their couple of years like you and I did. And then they met someone and that person wasn't interested in traveling overseas. So they ended up not ever doing it. So you know, it's really finding that exact timing is not such an easy thing. Okay, great answer. Thank you. Yes, I really appreciate that unpacking right there, because that is a topic Audrey and I were just talking about it yesterday. And I've got a son who's in his second year of teaching. And so we're looking at the possibility uh, the tug is pulling him to stay with his friends. So it is, as Audrey's saying, it really comes back to the individual. And you just brought up a great reminder that one can go overseas and work as an intern and that type of position. It reminds me my first post in Israel, Forrest Broman was the head of school, head of Thai online and all that. We had like eight interns there and boy, it was fun to hang out with them. I was a teacher and young at that time. So we had a great time. So that's um, another possibility for people who want to get a little experience and say, is this for me? Sign up for an internship program and go for it. Mm -hmm. All right. Continuing with the recruiting, and you just gave some great insights on the prep work and the communication and all that. Let's go into that interview room, whether it's at a conference or maybe online. But what are some things that you would advise people trying to get that job that they should be ready to bring to that recruiting interview session? So I do have some tips on that. First off, come prepared. So know what you're interviewing for. So know what the curriculum is, know what the school's like, know what the population is. Is it mostly locals? Is it, you know, expats? What does that look like? So do your research on the school. But there's some tips that sometimes in an interview, I just want to stop somebody and say, okay, time out, like stop. So when you ask the questions, so, you know, I have different questions for different positions. The interviewee needs to be very clear and try to limit everything to an answer that is about three minutes long. Mm. And I want to stress that because as a recruiter, we will understand, you know, if you can keep it to three minutes and you're succinct and you're able to say what you mean by the question. I've been in interviews where people have rambled on for 15 minutes. Well, you've lost me. <laughs> yeah. So follow some of those interview tips. So, you know, three minutes and then you know, stop talking. Try to loop things back to the school's mission or vision or something when you're talking about certain things. I think that's always very important. And if you don't understand the question, don't be shy to say, excuse me, can you elaborate? Or excuse me, can you repeat that? And sometimes we mistakenly ask, you know, three questions in one question. It's okay to stop and say, I'm sorry, I missed that. 
can you go back and redo that? So ask those clarifying questions. Those, all of those things show that you actually are paying a lot of attention and that you're really vested in this interview, but don't ramble on. <laughs> That's probably one of my biggest pet peeves. Yeah, but it's okay. I like that you said it's okay for a candidate to say, could you please clarify that question? And it's also okay to say, you know, I know you asked a three-parter. I forgot what the third part is. Please, would you remind me? That's not going to make you look bad. I think that that's something that as a, you know, a candidate, you do feel anxious about. So thank you for putting our minds at ease about that. It's really helpful. Mm -hmm. So what about after the interview? Do you, well, let's say the first round of mm -hmm. interview, what kind of follow-up would you suggest from the candidate? So for follow-up, one thing that as a recruiter, I do like a short, brief email. Just thank you so much. I really appreciate your time to talk about the art position and I look forward to more discussions. Just a short email also shows that you are really interested in my school because it's a two-way street. I need to be interested in them. They need to be interested in me. So just a short follow-up, thank you, is great. The other thing that I've had candidates do, and I often throw this out there as well, maybe it's a family and they've got two kids and they say, hey, Heather, could you hook me up with another family with two kids at your school so I could talk to them about what it's like having young kids at your school? Great. Do that in a heartbeat. Or can you hook me up with a single? And again, great way. Just be very open and transparent. You know, I think I use the word transparent probably too many times at recruiting fairs because I say, look, I'm going to be very transparent about, you know, what our <laughs> school is like, but I don't, I will never pull the wool over anybody's eyes. And some schools do, but it's very clear. This is our package. This is what we're offering. This is what you can get, but there's no beating around the bush. And I'm sure that candidates really appreciate that. That is not certainly every head who will do that, especially someone who you know, is in a place where it's a bit more challenging. And I've been given the skinny and I've been in a place where they kind of glossed over the skinny. And I definitely appreciate the transparency because as you say, it's got to be a good fit for the candidate too. Mm -hmm. They have to know what they're getting into. And I appreciate that you're also once again, giving the candidates, let's say the right, and also the confidence to just ask those questions, those probing questions and really get at what am I getting myself into? That's really important. Heather, this has been so informative and I'm really looking forward to when we can put this out for our followers to listen to. It's been such valuable information. So we're getting close to wrapping up. And one thing that really caught my interest off mic was you arrive a little bit early at a fair and then you do some learning. You go to a session and you, you're you growing as an administrator and a recruiter. Maybe that's something you can share. Yeah. So one of the things that I'll be working on this week with the help of search is so they have some DEIJ, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice listening circles. So I've signed up for that to be able to better understand how we can ensure that our schools are becoming more diverse. Being in West Africa now, and this is my first time in West Africa, it's very important to me to have the teachers look like the students. Right. So I want to make sure that we have diversity in our faculty. So we are actually, we do seek out diverse candidates. We've hired a number of diverse candidates for next year. We are an extremely diverse school. We have 86 different nationalities. That's so cool. It's great as a student body. But what's even cooler is we have 24 different nationalities for faculty. Wow. For teaching faculty. Yeah. So we've got Europeans from, we've got somebody from Croatia, for instance. We have cool. people from all over yeah. at our school. And we want to continue the diversity world. And diversity is very important to me. And I think as all of us as parents of third culture kids, we just want to make sure that we're representing all people from all walks of life, all sexual orientations, even. We want everything to be represented out there. And so I'm doing a lot of work in that at our school. And there's going to be some sessions this week that Search has put on that I'm excited to start attending. I can just imagine UN Day at your school. It must be quite a treat. Oh my gosh, it's great. Yeah. We had it in October. It was great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's awesome. Heather, at this point, we ask our guest how people can get in touch with them. How can they follow them? So how can people reach out to you? 
I think the best way to reach out to me and get a quick answer is through my school email. So my school email is heather.naro, N-A-R-O, at I-C-S-A-B-I-D-J-A-N dot org. And you can always look me up on our school website, International Community School of Abidjan, and my email's right there as well in case you missed that. Excellent, excellent. Well, like I said earlier, we've been looking forward for several months to bringing you on. And what a perfect time that you're right in the middle of the recruiting and you have your fingers on the pulse of that process. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing such wisdom. It's just been great having you here and great reconnecting after so many years from Saudi Arabia. Yeah, absolutely. I've said that many times that one of the most wonderful benefits of doing this podcast is reaching out to old friends and seeing where they're at and you know, chatting with them about what's going on in the world of international education, which we would all agree is just a wonderful, wonderful place to be. So thank you again so much for taking the time, especially as David said, in between fairs, I cannot believe you're still just newly arrived from London, you know, probably still jet lagging in a hotel and yet taking the time to do this before you jump into the Boston Fair. Thank you again so much, Heather. Well, thank you both. It's been great to reconnect. And I do really appreciate all the information you're sharing with your followers out there. Hopefully this was helpful to someone out there. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on Educators Going Global. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all the other usual suspects. Please subscribe, like us, and leave a review on Apple and Spotify and let your teaching friends know about us so we can grow our community. Please reach out at educatorsgoingglobal at gmail.com and join our Facebook group, Educators Going Global, if you have ideas, comments, or wish to share a going global story of your own. You can also find us on Instagram at Educators Going Global. Please visit our website as well, www.educatorsgoingglobal.com all our podcast episodes are on there by topic, along with blog posts, going global stories, and our ever-growing resource library. For now, this is Audrey and David inviting you to travel, teach, and connect with us.